Conservatives justify themselves as the real party of working people with their proposed tax credit changes? The question is about whether the Conservatives can justify themselves as the real party of working people. Suzanne Evans. No, I don't think they can. I'd like to take issue, actually, with Amber when you said you were transparent. Amber, you were clearly not transparent in your manifesto. We were all, and Andy's nodding, you know, we were all trying to find out exactly where these 12 billion cuts were going to come from, and you wouldn't say. And you're still not saying, and you're still actually keeping That's us in consistent. the dark. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a, if that's a consistency you're proud of, then fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it's a very good consistency. Um, look, you know, UKIP's position on this is that we support a benefit cap because we think that uh, while you've got to have a very strong and supportive safety net for people who fall on hard times, and it could happen to any one of us in this audience if it hasn't already, it cannot be a hammock and we can't support a benefits lifestyle. So we support that, and we obviously want to clamp down on welfare abuse. But there are some things that the Conservative Party have done that I think have, have just been awful. The bed Room tax is one thing. Hang on, we're talking um, about things they're going to do, not things they've done. Everybody knows what they've done. You're complaining you don't know what they're going to do. Well, I would, I would, I would like to see them abolish the bedroom tax, for start off, because right. I think it's been grossly unfair. Um, and what about the working tax credit? And in terms of tax credits, I think, you know, at the moment you can get tax credits up to quite a high income, but uh, they're being abused, actually, by big corporate companies who are using tax credits as a way to subsidise paying low wages so, to people. Sorry again, to interrupt you, so you mean you're in favour of Osborne's proposals if he makes them to cut back on working tax credits? Well, I know, because it, this, unfortunately it's not going to, while, we, while we've still got the tax credit system, I mean, First of all, if you're going to try and take people out of poverty, if you're going to try and make it pay to go to work, the first thing you've got to do is take everybody on minimum wage out of tax altogether. Because if it's the minimum wage is the minimum that anyone can live on, that is the first thing to do. It is absolutely ridiculous, it seems to me, to waste all that time and money on admin, uh, not to taking tax off people and then giving them back, giving, giving it back to them. And I'd like to see a, a, an economy where more people are in work, obviously, and there are all sorts of reasons about how we could get that going, but where ultimately we don't need to pay tax credits because we all have right. a strong economy and people are in work and working uh, and not having to take handouts from the state. You're shaking right. you, sir. It's just not on. It's not right. Yes, sir. Yes, for, for me, this is not a, so much about cuts. It's about efficiencies. When Labour Party brought in tax credits, I understand for a number of years, the system cost more than the money was actually being given out. It's absolutely ridiculous. So it's time I think, to go right back, raise the entry level of taxation, wipe tax credits off of the, off the system. I get letters, quarterly newsletters. My wife had the same address, gets exactly the same amount all the time. This cost is this the monolith. Get rid of it. You will save as much in efficiency by doing away as you will by targeting any one individual group. OK. Thank you very much. Well, on that. If the decision was in your hands, what would you do about Greece? If I could do one thing for Greece, I'd give it what a country in trouble needs more than anything else, and that's its own currency. Yeah. I mean, that is what Greece would... If they still have the drachma, the drachma would plunge in value, Greek goods would be incredibly cheap, not only could we all go there on holiday, but its exports would be a lot better. That's how countries get out of a mess. That's how we get out of the mess. And Black Wednesday, we came out of the ERM, the proto-euro thing, and it was painful at the time. But at the, then our huge recovery started. I mean, the pound has been such an asset to us. When the, um, when the crisis struck, the pound was devalued, we became more competitive. It's such a help. But right now, when they're locked in the euro, they can't do that. They have to go through this kind of sado austerity where they've got to do this internal devaluation. And it's heartbreaking seeing the things that right now the EU are asking the Greek government for, you know, to double the VAT on restaurants, to cut the government budget even more, and all for what? All to remain part of this... This bizarre Euro project. If you're it's right, why should they be so keen to remain in the Euro? Well, because, the, well, they because pull out? leaving it is a painful process. We found that out 20 years. There's no denial. There's no good option for Greece. They've just got the choice of two bad options. But I reckon that the pain of leaving the Euro now and defaulting is lesser evil. The greater evil is g being in this groundhog day of negotiations with the EU every six months and putting through these cuts that are causing so much incredible misery to the Greek people. What do you think the outcome will be? Or don't think outcome be well. I actually think that the Greek government almost want to get kicked out. Yeah. I mean, you know, the 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 Greek they're in a mandate to stay in the EU mm. and right. get a deal. Those two things exactly. can happen. I think they know that. Oh. I think the whole idea that the that the EU in the 70s and 80s was this benign a benign um, body which which was sort of socially sort of liberal and fine. Actually, I think that is now 
uh, been shown up for something. And, uh, you know, I'm a lefty. I used to believe in that project, but I think I don't believe in that project you'll, you'll anymore. You'll vote out, will you? When uh, I think I will vote out. I will think you? that tradition of people like Tony Benn, I think they were right about the European Union. And, uh, and I think that the lefties need to start saying that a bit more now. Okay. Bravo. What you Isn't it worrying that um, Greece might approach Russia and become allied to Russia if they drop out of the Euro and the EU? Suzanne Evans. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear well, that. I, I, I worry that the Greeks uh, will approach Russia and get support from Russia if they drop out of the EU. No, because I think Remember they'll they have far, stronger, and far stronger allies, there. and I suspect that this trip to Russia was probably a little bit more uh, uh, sort of, you know, banner-waving, actually, to try and get uh, Angela Merkel and her chums to, to bail out a little bit. I completely agree with both Giles and Fraser. Uh, Greece was conned into joining this Eurozone, into joining this club that it really should never have joined, and it can't play by the rules, and it would be absolutely best for it if it just bailed out. Um, you know, just that Giles talked about poverty, uh, austerity earlier here in the UK. What we're suffering here is nothing compared to what Greece is going through. And to go back to the original question, you know, if the decision was in my hands, what would I do for Greece? I would have to put the people of my country first. And at the moment, the people of Greece, they're living on £450 a month is the average wage in Greece. It's tiny. Half of young people of working age are unemployed. There's a 28% unemployment rate overall. Uh, you know, prostitution's increased 150%. The suicide rate has rocketed. This is a country that's facing austerity like we have never known. It is astonishingly bad. And they need to end the agony, break free of the euro, now, uh, the, the EU is saying, well, if you leave the euro, you have to leave the European Union as well. I think that's, that's probably another bit of flannel that we're getting from the EU. But absolutely, I agree with Giles. They should pull out of the EU as well. Self-determination, self-governance. <laughs> um, they can start to rebuild their economy after the short-term glitches. What I find astonishing at the moment is that the EU in, is demanding more austerity and is, is in, insisting that, as Fraser said, they put taxes on tourism. Now, tourism is 15% of Greek GDP. They they're basically trying to batter down right. so one Suzanne, of their most from important economies. Your point of view, you would just simply leave? I would simply leave. All right, do I think so. it would what be would the best do? in the long term. It's obvious that the EU is a failed experiment. Mm. The uh, Greece, so eager to join the EU, grossly overvalued the drachma, yes. and the EU accepted this on their calculations. And I agree with most of the panel mm. that the only answer is pull out of right. the EU and the uh, currency. You know, you know, even if they do a deal, uh, even if they pay this 1.7 billion that they've got to pay by the end of the month, they still owe the IMF over 33 billion. Yes. So there'll have to be another deal, and then another deal, and another deal coming down the tracks. And like we say, let's get out. Um, you said that Europe was a success. The EU was a success. Mm. Spain's suffered. Mm. Ireland's suffered. Mm -hmm. Greece has suffered. How can you say it's a success with all these struggling countries within the EU? All right, point made. And, and you, sir, there in the centre. I think the, the problem, you've hit the nail on the head, is that you shouldn't borrow money if you can't pay it back. All these... <laughs> These country, the countries have joined the euro. They've, they've taken, they've taken all the money that they can. They've afforded the money, and now we're blaming the creditors for giving the money in the first place. If all I right. don't pay my mortgage, I lose my house. That's the, that's the rules. That's how it works. What can the government do to stop the flow of illegal immigrants coming across the channel to the UK from Calais? What can the government do to stop the flow of illegal immigrants coming across the channel? Um, Suzanne Evans. It's dreadful, isn't it? The scenes that we've seen on our television over the last few days are absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, this is a humanitarian crisis such as I don't ever remember. Um, apparently, there are something like a million people literally queuing up on the North African coast to try and get into Europe. And whilst in an ideal world, we would want to find some way to accommodate them, the simple fact is that we can't. Um, there's an unlimited supply of people. The 3,000 people that we have in Calais, those terrible scenes, if they come into Britain, uh, there will be more people coming and more people coming. And where will it end? And eventually, this small crowded island, which is already struggling to support people in terms of housing, in terms of schooling, in terms of health care, it's just going to get to breaking point and it's going to impact uh, on, on us too. So it has to stop. And for me, that means, I think, first of all, tackling the problem at source. So we need... UN 
decisions that can actually help to uh, improve the situations in the war-torn countries that, 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 that are obviously fueling this, this plight of these, these migrants. But it also, I'm afraid, means practicing a little bit of tough love. And it means not letting them in. It means uh, saying to the European Union, we already have a, have a veto on migration, but holding fast to that and saying, I'm sorry, we simply cannot take any more people. Britain is brilliant, actually. We already have taken more than our fair share of asylum seekers, I think, 28,000 in Europe. We've taken a lot more than many other share. people in, in Europe. I, I think we, we've already taken, taken a huge amount. And, um, yeah, we, we have to basically also tackle the people traffickers. People trafficking now has become a massive industry. I think I read somewhere that it's actually overtaken the, the illegal <coughs> drug industry in terms of the money it, uh, it, it creates. I think it's a, about a £20 billion industry now. And these people are criminals. They are cruel. They are brutal. We've had scenes, you know, they're, they're, they're pushing Christians overboard from the boats coming over from the Mediterranean. They're shooting people on the shores. We have to stop it. And the only way we can actually stop this brutal and cruel trade is by saying enough. Well, Amber, you said that foreign aid was trying to help countries. That is just factually incorrect. There have been studies about simple mosquito nets where the people, the administrators were pocketing 500,000, 200,000 pounds mm. simply administrating the jobs. And the mosquito nets didn't even work. By your own standards, your foreign aid sort of a program is a shambles, is it not? I completely disagree. The mosquito nets sprayed with anti-malaria have been incredibly effective at so, saving so children's Are you disagreeing lives. with the study? Are you disagreeing with the study that looked into the specific mosquito net case and said it was a failure? Are you disagreeing with that study? I am disagreeing study? with that. I'm saying the point was they needed to be sprayed with the anti-malaria You can't just spray. make things up. I'm a not. study is a study. I'm, I'm not over here. What we should say to these people is welcome, absolutely welcome. Giles, a moment ago, you were talking about the problems of people not having enough work in this country. How is that going to help working class people when our population, which is already at a new time, how is that going to help? I'll tell, tell, tell you what helps. It's not that there's just a small amount of jobs to go around. Actually, people who come here and actually add to our economy and, and create a more yep. vibrant and economy, add... build up our economy and create more jobs. Right. I think these are really good people uh, to have. And, and I think there's too many people in this country already. We can't accommodate more coming into this country. Um, I'm a nurse in the NHS and I can see how overcrowded this country is. Mm. Um, we're talking about people starving from other countries. There are people starving in this country as well. There's not enough housing for people in this country. We can't accommodate any more. For me, all of these arguments um, are just pointing towards an Australian-style point system where we can make the discretion between refugees, claimants, people that come here to work, Absolutely right, and that's UKIP's policy. And just to go back to the ladies talking about the NHS, you're absolutely right. 30% of doctors in the NHS are immigrants and do a great job. But you know what? Only 5% of health workers in Germany are immigrants, and part of the problem is we're not training our own people. True. And, uh, you know, the... Uh, the the Royal College of Nurses, the Royal College of Nurses has 100,000 applicants for nursing jobs every year from people in this country and only 20,000 actually get places. Right. We need to be creating a Thank heck of you. a lot more medical school in Thank these places. You. Yeah, um, to tackle health issues, costs as well as the issue of health itself, um, rising obes uh, obesity, diabetes, should um, high sugar, high fat foods have higher tax or disincentives versus locally produced or um, healthy foods have a better In other better, words, sh should the state tax high fat and high sugar because of Ta the harm done, yes? Tax or incentives and disincentives. Yes. <laughs> the, the answer is no, absolutely not. Um, I have a kind of personal relationship with this, really, because all my life I've suffered, well, since puberty, I've suffered from a disease called lipedema, which makes me abnormally fat in my arms and my legs. And I only discovered this about three years ago, after a lifetime of being told I was obese and I was overeating and I needed to lose weight. And actually, the condition I have, and obesity is very complicated, it's not just about sugar or fat it's not about uh, it's not as simple as saying what you eat in if you eat too much you'll put on weight if you don't eat enough you, you <clears> lose <throat> weight I know personally that's not that simple and so a simple headline answer like that it's a great soundbite for a politician but believe you me it won't work obesity okay. is much more complex than that thank you very much we've got time for one one last question I think from James Hanley please James Hanley 
Is Alan Milburn right when he said that anybody defending Labour's last general election manifesto is practising a form of self-delusion? Well, you know, it, the Labour manifesto was so woolly, it didn't really have anything to go on. It wasn't costed. UKIP's manifesto was fully was. costed. It you know, was. everything... No, it wasn't. Everything that we had in the UKIP manifesto <laughs> was had a uh, measurable Let's not fight the last outcome. election now. We just, and, uh, just you know, a that, quick that, comment on that, what that, Milburn that's said. That's why, Andy, you know, you, you have lost 75% right. of your voters, working-class voters from Labour in certain parts of the country, have come to UKIP. They have to... <laughs> we've, come, we've come full circle back to the beginning of the programme, but we do have to stop there, because... You didn't frankly have the balls to put country before party.